All right, so we've just finished re-envisioning rational tangles, not as being built out of operations that are geometric, but being built out of operations that are arithmetic. In other words, we've chased down the consequences of defining rational tangles as anything which can be built out of an empty tangle by adding ones and minus ones to build out horizontal twists, and also multiplying by ones and minus ones to build out vertical twists. Addition and multiplication turned out to be the operations that matter for building tangles. And we also, in our last video, saw a set of operations that don't matter to the isotopy type of a tangle, the horizontal and vertical flips and the horizontal and vertical flips. And what was great about the flips and flips, besides that they're fun to say, is that we can also use them to prove, as we did at the end of the last video, that when it comes to building a tangle, any twists that we try to build out on the left side of a tangle or on the top side of a tangle can equally well be thought of by fliping as twists that are happening on the right side of a tangle or the bottom side of a tangle. And so twists toward the right and twists toward the bottom are all that matters in building out rational tangles, according to what we just won in the last video. So what that gives us is a canonical way to build a tangle that only uses right twists and bottom twists. We're going to chase in this video the arithmetic consequences of that and how it will permit us to, in a nice way, assign to a given rational tangle a rational number, with the ultimate goal of us then also being able to go back the other way and figure out for a given rational number which rational tangle should it be associated with. So this was the big surprise in our last video, that any left and top twists in a rational tangle, we can always flip them down to be right and bottom twists, and that won't change the isotopy type of the tangle at all. What that does for us is it gives us a standard way to build a rational tangle. So all rational tangles can therefore be constructed in a standard form. The standard form begins with a horizontal empty tangle and then iteratively begins by adding twists on the right side of that tangle. So we're going to say let's add t1 twists to the right side. t1 could be a positive integer, it could be a negative integer. And then after I'm done adding those twists to the right, I'll take that tangle and I'll introduce some twists on the bottom by multiplying by the vertical tangle 1 over s1. And so what I'll get is an arithmetic expression that looks like this, 0 plus t1, and then the quantity multiplied by 1 over s1. Now that I've introduced some more twists on the bottom, I can then introduce more twists, and I can do so only on the right. And then I can introduce more twists on that only on the bottom. Right? So because the flips are isotopy invariants, we can always think of all of our twists as happening only on the right and only on the bottom. And so that will give us a recipe for building a rational tangle in what we call the standard form. And what's great about that is that because our twists are only happening on the right and on the bottom, that means that our arithmetic is only accruing from left to right in our expression. We're not ever adding to our tangle or multiplying to our tangle on the left. We can only multiply on the right and still be able to describe every possible rational tangle. And each of those steps has an effect on the tangle number that's predictable. In particular, we know what addition of twists does to our tangle number. We learned that two videos even more ago, um, that adding a twist to the right side of a tangle just adds that same number, that same positive integer, to the tangle number. So if I compare uh, a tangle G with that tangle where n more twists have been added on the right side, that the tangle number is just going to go up by the rational number n. So that's a very predictable effect. Now the effect that adding twists on the bottom of a tangle has is a little bit more complicated um, because it can't be just multiplication and it also can't be just addition. It's got to be some combination, right? It has to somehow be intertwined with the operation which rotates my tangle that can turn an addition of twists on the right into somehow an addition of twists on the bottom. And indeed that's exactly how it works. That if I want to know what happens with uh, with adding twists on the bottom, what I can do is instead take those twists, rotate them to the right, and then think about adding them here, and then rotate them back down to the bottom. So the effect, and Kaufman and Lambropoulou proved this in lemma number four in their paper, the effect of adding bottom twists is a conjugate addition, where the addition is conjugated by the reciprocal operation. Reciprocal of tangles, remember, is the same thing as rotating and then also uh, taking the mirror image, re reversing all the crossings. So adding twists on the bottom is the same as taking the tangle, rotating it, 
then adding the twist on the right, and then rotating it back. And that makes perfect sense. And so that's the effect that multiplying by tangles has. Reciprocal, then add, then take a reciprocal. So what that does is if we have an expression for a rational tangle in this standard form, where we first take some twists on the right, then we combine it with some twists on the bottom, and then we combine it with more twists on the right, more twists on the bottom, and so forth. That's my tangle written in standard form. And we know now that we can always build any rational tangle through that series of right twists, followed by bottom twists, followed by right twists, followed by bottom twists, and so on and so forth. And we also know that each of these addition operations that's happening at the level of tangles will operate as addition in the realm of rational numbers. And each of these multiplication operations happening on tangles is going to operate as that conjugate addition, reciprocal, then addition, then reciprocal, at the level of tangle numbers. Then what that tells me is that another way to write this expression, rather than as this iterated, iterated arithmetic happening from left to right, is we can combine addition and reciprocals in the way that's dictated by this to get a new kind of expression for my tangle that starts with the, the very last uh, set of twists that I would make, and then adds the reciprocal of that number of bottom twists added to the reciprocal of that next number of side twists added to the reciprocal, and so on and so on and so on, building an expression that mathematicians call a continued fraction. So at this point, what we've convinced ourselves is that because we can write every rational tangle in this standard form that only uses right and bottom twists, and because we know what the arithmetic effect of right and bottom twists are, we know every rational tangle can be written in one of these continued fraction expansions. And so the natural thing to do is because each of these numbers, tn, sn minus 1, tn minus 2, and so forth, because all of those numbers are just integers, we can associate to this tangle an expression in rational number arithmetic that's completely analogous, that just takes these integers and does the same thing adds tn plus the reciprocal of sn minus 1 plus the reciprocal of tn minus 2 plus the reciprocal, and so on and so on, all the way down to t1. And all of these ti's and si's, in my original formulation here, the ti's were my horizontal twist numbers and the si's were my vertical twist numbers, all of those are just integers. Positive integers, negative integers, but they're integers. Right? And this gives me an expression which we can evaluate, we can do the arithmetic out, to find out that this is just a rational number. Right? If all of these tn's and sn's are integers, this is then a rational number. And going back and forth between the worlds of rational tangles and rational numbers, the continued fraction representation is going to be our key to doing that. For the sake of notation, if you're playing around with continued fractions, which are well-studied objects in mathematical theory of numbers, uh, a compact notation that one can use is just put a, a set of square brackets around everything and then just list out the integers which make my continued fraction. So uh, in the case of building a rational tangle in the continued fraction representation, we'll also have the little brackets around the integers to indicate that these are actually tangles that we're continued fractioning together. And then uh, conversely in the realm of rational numbers, um, all of these tn's, sn's, and so forth are just going to be integers written inside of these square brackets in a list that tells us how to then build a continued fraction out of it. And for the sake of our sanity, we began this process um, by starting with a rational tangle that began with t1 twists in the beginning, and then added s1 vertical twists, s2 horizontal twists, and so forth. And so when we built the tangle, we were kind of going from the innermost part of this continued fraction out to the outermost. And so just to keep our sanity when we're thinking about continued fractions in the abstract, I'm just going to renumber these tn's and sn's to be a1, a2, and so forth, right? With the understanding that if I'm going to build this tangle, if I'm going to write it down, the first twists that I would do are these innermost twists down here at the bottom. So to every rational tangle in continued fraction form, we will associate a rational number, which is the same rational number um, as our continued fraction representation over here. Uh, and now I realize that I have a typo over here. Let me fix that before we go on. There we go. Sorry about that. So what's great about continued fractions is, again, that the number theorists and mathematicians have studied their properties pretty extensively. Um, and a couple of things that are useful for us to know about continued fractions that, again, Kaufman and Lombropoulou have actually gone through some trouble in their paper to establish, um, is that there exists a form in which we can write any continued fraction representation which is canonical. In other words, this is going to be kind of the best practice. This is going to be the preferred way in which we can write a continued fraction. Um, we can always come up with an expression of a continued fraction in which all of the integers that we use to build that continued fraction have the same sign. They're either all positive or they're all negative. 
And we can also do it in a way that the length, the number of integers that we use to build this continued fraction, is odd. So as an example, if I have the rational number 23 over 14, and I happen to know, and we're going to talk in our next video about how to know this, but I, if I happen to know that a continued fraction representation for 23 over 14 might be 2 minus 3, 4, 1. In other words, 2 plus the reciprocal of negative 3 plus the reciprocal of 4 plus the reciprocal of 1. right? Then how can I see that this has a canonical form? What would the canonical form of this be? Well, the first observation that I'd make is that this very last computation that we did here, 4 plus 1 over 1, actually just gives me a single integer, the number 5. So I could just combine that 4 and that 1 into a 5 and get a shorter continued fraction representation, which now has an odd number of terms in it, 2, negative 3, 5. That's three terms uh, in my continued fraction. So that takes care of this odd length issue. Um, taking care of the same sign issue is a little bit more intricate, and if you want the details, you can go to the proof of their Proposition 3. Um, but essentially, it kind of involves the borrowing of, of numbers from this odd sign term here uh, to try and get the odd sign to eventually disappear in a way that doesn't make the signs that are next to it change from positive to negative in this case. So in this case, that iterative process would lead us to a bunch of ones. Right? Uh, and so you can chase down the arithmetic that this continued fraction is the same as this one. 1 plus the reciprocal of 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 4. And by the time all of that works its way through, we still have 23 over 14. So all these continued fraction representations tell us the same rational number, but the one we arrived at at the end is the canonical form, because the length of this continued fraction representation is odd, there are five terms in it, and all of the integers that we use to build it are all positive. They all have the same sign. So continued fractions are going to be our tool that let us go back and forth between the worlds of, uh, of rational tangles and rational numbers. And so the most concrete way that we can use this is to actually put it into practice. How do continued fractions mediate that relationship? And that very computational video will be the last one uh, in this topic for us.